Hello everyone, welcome to Atoms and Sporks, and in this video, I want to talk about quantum physics. Which, you know, makes me literally the bajillionth person on the internet to do so. However, the reason I'm making this video is because I feel like almost all of those sources fail at conveying the absolute most important bit of information. That quantum physics is at the heart of basically every single significant technology that human civilization has developed since at least the 1970s. And based on so many of these sources, that may actually seem like surprising information. Almost all of them entirely focus on one single solitary aspect of the theory, what is called the measurement paradox, and then produce this very alienating idea of what quantum physics is and why it matters. I mean, it, it's a cat who's like a zombie, and it's, it's forced through some slits, and it's either in two places at once, or maybe it's magically teleporting across the universe, and, and Alice is measuring its spin. No, wait, wait, no, Bob is opening a glove box and putting on a right-handed glove, and... Uh, I mean, you get the idea. You may, you've probably maybe seen these things. It all makes it seem that basic quantum mechanics is a cutting-edge frontier of basic physics research that is, to be honest, locked in the ivory tower. It makes for some nice dinner conversation to try and impress your guests, or some heated armchair philosophy discussions, but it hasn't really produced anything super useful. Sure, you, you might have heard that someday. We might have these like things like fancy quantum computers or the like, but so far, it's mostly just an arcane curiosity, famous for making really smart people say things like, no one can understand quantum physics. Well, the reason for this video is because that is wrong. Like, so wrong. Computers, for example, work by quantum physics. Not quantum computers. I mean the actual thing I'm using right now. It's powered by quantum physics. Microchips and integrated circuits? Quantum physics, baby. Lasers? Quantum mechanical devices. CD, DVD, and Blu-rays? Quantum devices. Your PlayStation, Xbox, or Nintendo? A quantum device. LED lights? Quantum. Solar panels? Quantum. Flash and solid state memory? Quantum. The telecommunication and fiber optic systems that power the internet? Quantum. MRI machines? Cancer radiation therapy? Nuclear power? Nuclear weapons? Hell, even neon signs? Quantum. 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 And that's not even mentioning the pretty basic fact that all of modern chemistry, all of modern metallurgy, all of modern material science is driven by our understanding of the quantum behavior of atoms and electrons. You know, some newspaper articles and popular science outlets have made the bold claim that when we invent quantum computers, we will enter the quantum age. Man, no! We were always in the quantum age. The space age and the digital age were the quantum age. Nothing against space exploration, but the first transistor, the quantum device at the heart of computing technology, was invented in 1947. And by 1971, Intel had released the first consumer microprocessor based on those devices. So if you want to live to see the quantum age, I mean, good job. You did it. I, I knew you could do it. In fact, most of these inventions, really all of modern computing and electronics, come from what is called quantum many-body theory, which may seem like a pretty opaque or abstruse name, but it's actually pretty easy to parse its meaning. When the ideas of quantum physics are often introduced to new learners, the focus is generally on the individual quantum object. You know, you get taught about how the behavior of a single atom is far, far different than what we would have ever expected before quantum physics. It's not like a little solar system of electrons orbiting a nucleus, but much more like, like the standing waves of a string or, or a trumpet, with certain discrete harmonics and diffuse wave shapes. So the focus is on emphasizing how weird and different a single atom is relative to previous physics expectations. But if you thought that was different, what happens when you put many, many of these quantum objects together is a whole other level of difference from our ape brain experiences. And that's what quantum many-body theory is about. It's about the physical behavior that emerges from not having one quantum object, but by having many, many of them. In fact, there's a very famous phrase physicists use to describe this, which is, more is different. 
Another name for quantum antibody physics, by the way, is kinetic spider physics, or more simply, solid state physics, which maybe makes things clearer. A crazy physics experiment with lasers and ultra cold atoms may be a quantum antibody system, but really, just an everyday solid like a chunk of metal is also a many body quantum system. That's really what we're talking about here. Before the advent of quantum physics, we kind of thought of the electrons and atomic nuclei in a solid chunk of material as either being sort of a, a freely flowing sort of charged liquid or fluid, or kind of being a smeared out fixed background of charge. However, quantum physics taught us that even though this macroscopic picture could occasionally be approximately correct, it was really hiding a far more different and far more interesting microscopic picture than we expected. Where quantum physics showed us that individual atoms had these sort of bound wave harmonic states, many atoms, arranged in something like a repeating pattern of a solid material, formed a continuum of states. Some of these states maybe aren't so different from the very closely bound states of the original atoms, but also some were extremely different, with the electron states being broadened out kind of like a sine wave over the entire material. One electron in a solid, in essence, was seeing all the atoms of the solid at once. Furthermore, where with single quantum objects we saw these sharp discrete allowed energies the electrons could have based on these sort of funky resonant waveforms, but in many body systems, if we looked at the energy of allowed states, they formed kind of separate extremely complex continua, which we call bands, punctuated by ranges of energies where no electron states exist. No electron in the whole material could have those ranges of energies, which we call band gaps. And with this understanding, suddenly so much that had long been a mystery became clear. A single copper atom is not shiny. It's not electrically conductive. It doesn't have an orange tint. It can't be stretched or bent. But many copper atoms can. Those aren't properties of copper. They're properties of many copper atoms forming a metallic state. Furthermore, a copper atom and an aluminum atom don't particularly look more or less different than, say, a copper atom and a carbon atom. And yet, when I have many copper or aluminum atoms, they both form metals and have a great similarity, where many carbon atoms form the insulator diamond. I mean, even with the same atom, one gets different many-body states. Carbon is a perfect example. Depending on conditions, the exact same atom can be made to form the physically hard transparent insulating state of diamond diamond, or the black, opaque, and soft state of graphite, or even the new wonder state graphene, which you may have heard of. With quantum physics, we understood all of this. We understood why the metallic or insulating states behaved the way they did, why some atoms could form one or the other, what determined it. We could perfectly describe and model any intermediate states, and even learned about literally dozens or even hundreds of new states we didn't even know could exist before. But really, this is underselling it, and it's underselling things in two big ways. The first thing to understand is that a physical theory like quantum mechanics is not just a bunch of like vague qualitative insights. It didn't really just alert us to the vague idea that say electrons and solids could hold continuous bands punctuated by band gap ranges of energies where no states existed. No, quantum physics is a mathematical theory. It allows us to precisely and quantitatively calculate and determine the exact structure and nature of these states. And that actually leads us nicely to the second big way I've kind of undersold things. This mathematical framework reveals to us the precise knobs and variables that determine the properties of things like materials. Well, we can then use that to manipulate, control, and engineer the quantum states of solids to do our bidding. Specifically, we can apply an electric field if we want to tune these states in real time, or we can alter them permanently by engineering material strain, which distorts the shape of these continuum of states in a targeted way, or by literally injecting impurity atoms into the material. These impurity atoms are chosen so that they join the material, but they have a different number of electrons than the rest of the atoms. And thus, rather than distorting the states themselves, they more cause a change in the filling of these energy states. And we don't just do this across the whole material, we do it locally. In a single solid chunk of material, we can use approaches like this to create different physical regions engineered 
to have different quantum states, and thus manipulate the flow of electrons. For example, we might make a kind of mask, or stencil, with a set of shapes cut out of it to make holes. We then use that as kind of a protecting layer over the material, and then use a particle accelerator to shoot impurity atoms into the material. Which, by the way, if you thought particle accelerators were only for, like, huge physics experiments in Geneva, nope. We literally use particle accelerators to make all these technologies. Your iPhone, your computer, your PlayStation, made by depositing impurity atoms with a particle accelerator, a technique called ion implantation. Also, literally CRT TVs are particle accelerators. But anyways, because of this mask, not all regions get embedded impurity atoms, and thus we can manufacture a so-called junction between two regions whose spectrum of electron quantum states is different. But specifically, quantum physics tells us not only qualitatively how such junctions behave, but allows us to precisely engineer this discrepancy in states to get the behavior we want. So we have one single chunk of material, but material properties are manipulated to be different at different spots to create a whole range of functionalities and all kinds of these quantum junctions. That's why we call these integrated circuits. It's not physically different devices connected by physical wires, it's just a single hunk of silicon with the wire transistors and switches part, and I'm using parts in quotes, being determined by things like where the impurity atom have been implanted via a particle accelerator or not, and the way quantum states get manipulated at the junctions between regions. I mean, let's just go through the list. All of these technologies are so-called solid-state technologies, and fundamentally operate through using levers like applied voltages, illuminating with light, engineering material strain, or implanting impurity atoms to create junctions or disconnects between regions of different quantum electron states to create a certain effect. Computers and microchips. Well, at the heart of these are these little packages that protect the integrated circuit. Inside there is a slab of silicon called a die. That's the actual integrated circuit. The rest of this is just periphery circuitry. On this, using the kind of techniques we already talked about with the masking and the particle accelerator, we pattern literally billions of tiny devices called MOSFET transistors. Each transistor is a so-called PNP junction, which means it's made of two junctions like we've discussed with different numbers of impurity atoms, and because of these junctions, the thing has an extremely high resistance to electrical current. That is, until you apply a voltage or electric field to the middle region. This electric field, again, reconfigures the quantum states, making it more like a metal than an insulator, and current then flows. So it's a switch, a zero or a one, based on applied voltage, and just by patterning billions of them into a single integrated circuit, we make computers and microchips. A laser, or at least a semiconductor laser, like in your Blu-ray player, basically just involves making one of these quantum junctions to prod the electrons in the material into a state called population inversion. LED. Make a laser that sucks, basically, and stimulated emission is poor. Solar panel. Make an LED and run it backwards, with light creating excited electrons. Digital cameras. I mean, honestly, make a structure that's somewhere in between a solar panel and a transistor, just with different sets of engineering specifications. CD, DVD, Blu-ray, PlayStation, Nintendo, and Xbox. Take a laser and some microchips, replay Uncharted 4 and Witcher 3. Flash install the state memory. Make a transistor and use a quantum effect called quantum tunneling to make electrons flow like waves through non-conductive regions that pre-quantum physics would say is impossible. Use that to strand the suckers on an isolated island of metal. Leave them there. Yeah, well, let's do the rest. Though these are not solid-state technologies, they're not based on creating junctions and materials, but they are still just as based in quantum physics, just largely through approaches we really haven't touched on, but whatever, let's keep going. Nuclear power. Identify an atomic nucleus that really likes to absorb neutrons, and when it does, it really regrets absorbing that neutron, and it makes it fall apart. It also has to fall apart into a bunch of stuff, plus some heat, and more neutrons. Use the heat to run a steam engine. Nuclear weapons. I mean, kind of the same, except make the sample, like, way, 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 way more pure, and also find a way to compress the sample in a split second, using something like an implosion shockwave. CRT television. Make an electron particle accelerator and raster it with a time-changing electric field. Neon signs. Make an electron particle accelerator and put a gas in it. Cancer radiation therapy. Make a super high-quality electron particle accelerator, shoot it at a piece of metal. X-ray scanners. Kind of the same thing, to be honest. MRI machines. Literal magic. 
Okay, okay, fine. Using a super strong magnetic field to make the quantum spins of hydrogen atom nuclei all orient in the same direction, where they usually orient randomly, use a pulse of radio light to disturb this aligned spin state and see how long it takes for them to relax back to it. Use that information to determine the environment that water molecules, which contain two hydrogen atoms, find themselves in throughout the body. And done. And of course this list is nowhere near exhaustive. If either a microchip, a laser, or even a digital sensor is crucial for its operation, it should be on this list. And I'm also completely leaving out the entirety of things like modern chemistry. Chemical bonds, bond energies, reaction rates, molecular geometry, all of that needs to be worked out with quantum physics. But let's finish things off. Now, of course, I didn't explain any of these technologies in any great detail, and that's because my goal here was only to motivate the simple truth that quantum physics is the basis of the modern age. But if people would like a fuller dive into any of this stuff, just let me know in the comments. Also, please, if you like this stuff, like and subscribe. I hope I made a believer out of you that we were always in the quantum age, and maybe hopefully help foster an appreciation of just how freaking amazing so much technology around us really is. That that we've kind of just become numb to. We made quantum devices made of a billion engineered junctions and quantum states, each less than a few hundred atoms large, so that we could bend and switch electron flows and crammed it all into a single slab of basically what's non-oxidized glass, selling it for peanuts, and all so we could just watch like way too many cat videos. It really is incredible. Have a good one.